Macy's Memorial Day sale has everything you need to dive into summer the right way with specials like 30 to 40 percent off sandals, slides, and more, and 25 to 40 percent off tops and shorts from Ink, Tommy Hilfiger, and more. Plus, refresh your space with 50% off hotel bedding. And Macy's Star Rewards members can earn rewards even faster during Star Money bonus days. See Macy's.com slash Star Rewards. Savings off regular sale and clearance prices. Exclusions apply. Family. It looks a little different for everyone. For some, it's mom and dad. For others, roommates who feel like family. And for others, it's your significant other, their golfing buddies, your children, a high school soccer team starting lineup, and oh look, they're all taking you up on the offer to stay for dinner, really testing the limits of that phrase, the more the merrier. But no matter where you call home, GEICO makes it easy to bundle and save on home and car insurance. Easier than making three frozen pizzas and assorted frozen veggies into a cohesive meal. Welcome to another BritFlix.com podcast. My name's Stuart Wright, and my guest is Paul Summers, who perhaps does the best impersonation of my name, Stuart Wright. Do you not? Stuart Wright. Hey! Yeah. hey. Not heard that for years. Is that wrong? Is, Stuart, is that wrong? Is Stuart Wright. Indeed. Okay, yeah. But that's not only how I know Paul. Paul <laughs> is a musician. He is a tour manager, and he's an all-round good guy, I would say. Uh, our paths crossed in both guises and they're crossing again back on the first guys. So when you were in 10 Benson, which was when, Paul? Uh, that would have been around about the early 2000s. Was that Satan Kidney from, Pie? That was the Satan Kidney Pie and the Danger of Death uh, albums and also the, the compilation Benson Bruner. Wow. So there we go. But but I, I came to speak to you when St. Kidney Pie was coming out. And That's right, yeah. we had a lovely chat in, a, in an East London pub. Yes, we did, yeah. And I think, I think, if I remember rightly, Paul, did we venture into Wiggy from uh, the infamous Animal Farm movie? Um, we we did venture into that movie, yes. And uh, unfortunately, my input was as somebody who had actually seen the movie. So, yeah. Yeah, what can I say? It was, uh, 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 you know, I'm of that age. Yeah. Well, it was a right of passage for me to hear, to hear about someone who's watched it because it was only ever a legendary film that I'd never seen. So, you mm. know, that's where our relationship began. And then, yes. <laughs> and then a few yes. years later, I was uh, co-managing a rock band called Tokyo Dragons, which if you could see right now what I can see on the Zoom, Paul is wearing the Tokyo Dragons trucker cap. I've worn it as, as as tribute to you. Steve. Good man. Yeah. I, I dug it out on the phone. I'm going to wear this. It's going to look great on the radio. Well, Paul made sure the Tokyo Dragons, as their tour manager, got everywhere and got there in good spirits. I do believe mm. is a way of describing what you did. I tried to keep the spirits uh, high, yeah, and they certainly were high spirited, uh, certainly high spirited bunch. So, not too difficult a job. No. Fantastic. They were happy days, as they say. Yep. And uh, and now we're back full circle. I'm talking to you as a member of Demonic Fonts. Do you want to tell you want to tell the world that's listening to this a bit about Demonic Fonts? Okay, yeah. Well, Demonic Fonts is a band which I am in. I play guitar and I do a little bit of singing with my brother. A fella called Sam Mansbridge, our drummer Gee, and a fantastic lady keyboard player called Hannah. Corv Finger Ed Grant, formerly of the fantastic Tits of Death. We got together, we recorded our debut album. The debut album is called I Love Demonic Fonts. And it's out right now in the shops or available on all in all good record shops via our band camp. But even better, come and see us play live and buy our vinyl record at a Demonic Fonts gig. Now, before yeah. we get into the film side of this chat, because there'll be people on my podcast stream who are going, why is he talking to someone in a band? We are definitely going to talk about five films, and it's a great title this week. But before we do, do you want to um, 
talk about maybe on, on this album, some of the things that were influenced in this record, because there's some fantastic titles on this album that speak to that speak to you and made me smile when I was listening. Okay. Throw a few at me. The first one that sucked me in, as it were, as a, as a first time listen, and, and knowing you, Paul Summers, was Badges and Ferrets. Where where were we coming from for that? Okay, first off, I'm a, I'm an animal lover. Okay, okay, and I I've always loved ferrets. I had ferrets when I was a child, when I was a kid. Mm. Really fantastic pets. Whatever anybody says about ferrets, they're very very loving pets, and I can highly recommend you get one. Okay, I've always been reminded. When I see badgers, they do kind of look a little bit like ferrets, like but slightly bigger, obviously. Yeah. And when I heard about the badger cull, it really upset me. So com- the combination of being upset by the badger cull, trying to learn how to use a computer to record stuff at home. Right. And my dad, my dad actually saying the line, it's tranquil in the forest, now the bluebells are growing. Really? My dad said that to me. I was visiting my family at home in Wales, came in, my dad had come out from a walk and he said, it's tranquil in the forest, now the bluebirds are growing. And I was like, I'm taking that. Is he, is he, is he credited as a songwriter? Oh, of course not. <laughs> no, no chance. <laughs> <laughs> I owe him way more money than that anyway. But, <laughs> uh, but, <laughs> but anyway, yeah, I was like, I was actually really upset by the Badger Cull of 2015, 16, myself and Brian May. You know, and I thought, right, I'm going to put pen to paper here. I've got the first line. I love badgers. I love ferrets. I'm going to somehow write a song that highlights my love of badgers and ferrets. And there it goes, badgers and ferrets. And that is probably, aside from a song that I'd written about Ivor Cutler, Mm. the first actual fully formed song that I'd written since I was in Tempest. Seriously? Yeah. Well, I was, I was, I feel, I feel like I'm, I feel like I've got a, like a Paul Summer radar then, because like I was immediately drawn to that as being Paul Summers. Yeah. So that's where that one came from. Absolutely. One line, badgers and ferrets. One line from my dad and some badgers and some ferrets. Is Animal Magic also from, from the pen of uh, Paul Summers? Yeah. Now that one came strictly from the work, from slow workings. I come home from a pub one night. I had like a little tune and I was drunk. And I sat in front of the computer, drunk. And I just started thinking about slow worms. I just started ranting in front of it. And whatever came out, I thought, that's good. That's good. And the other one is swinging the lead. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know the word swinging the lead means? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Lead swinger, yeah. Well... We used to joke when we all worked on building sites that we were all lead swingers, you know, swinging the lead. Taking the, skiving, taking the, taking the piss. It's skiving, you know. Yeah. yeah. So it just came, I, I, you know, Johnny Johnny Morris, uh, all these things that are there from years ago. Uh, and, uh, yeah, slow worms. Again, do you know what a slow worm is? Do you know I don't? Are you going to tell me? Do you not? No. Yeah, of course not. Well, the thing is, like, when, same thing. When you're running around the woods, when you're a kid or whatever, you, you, you'd be chucking bricks and rocks around or whatever, lifting stones up. And we find these things that look like snakes, but they're actually slow worms. Yeah? All right. And I, was saying this, and I was saying this the other day to a friend of mine who does a bit of gardening. I was like, you must know what a slow worm is, surely. And they were like, no, what are you talking about? We all, we all, they don't live very long. Really. Maybe you're not supposed to keep them, but, you know, we'd find these things that look like snakes. They weren't snakes, they slow worms. Yeah. Isn't there that just go. a worm? No, no, mate. It, it's the size of a, like an adder. You know what I mean? Oh, really? I've never seen well, that then. Well, mate, if you lifted a stone up and saw one, you'd, your first reaction would be, I found a snake. My first reaction would probably be to run, if I'm honest with you, Paul. No, you, you wouldn't. I'm a big I mean, they're slow. They're slow. <laughs> slow doesn't matter. Being okay. being being the size of an adder, un- just lying yeah. in wait under a stone is enough for me to. Maybe work. I'm wrong. I, I don't actually know a bit. I, 
I've never, I don't know if I think I've ever seen an adder, but I've definitely seen slow worms. Again, big influence on the song, Animal Magic, yeah? Nature, all that kind of stuff. It feed one, definitely. And the dead Kennedys, yeah. Where's the Kennedys fit into that? Well, I put a bit of delay on the guitar and I was like, that sounds a bit like the dead Kennedys. Got you, got you. You know what I mean? Bit of surf, guitar kind of vibe there. I get you. I Again. Get you. I can't tell you how big of a fan I am. Well, look, I won't. We won't. We won't analyze every track because this is a okay. film podcast. It's a film podcast. Yeah. But I would say it's ten songs. It's thirty-five minutes. You're in. You're out. And you've been shook up when you've done it. That's it. Perfect. Brilliant. And that's how it should be, shouldn't it? That's rock and roll. Right. Do you know what? No album should be longer than thirty-five minutes. Really, should it? No. In in old money terms, Paul, if it doesn't fit on one side of a C ninety, it's not an album, is it? <laughs> There you go. Somebody's been <laughs> fanning about. Once again, he's got it spot on. <laughs> well, look, dude, let us do the fantastically titled Five Films That Have Influenced Me, Paul Summers, and that's, Two that's me. That Have Influenced Everything I've Done in My Adult Life. That is a fairly wild claim, and I look forward to uh, unpicking that with you. Now, we're going to do that. That's the five times five mm. format, which is five films in five minutes. I have a list of five films. They're in okay. date order, although Fantastic. although three of them are all the same year, so they're in alphabetical yeah, order. Yeah, yeah. Okay, right, yeah. Uh, just to make it life easy for me. But what we are going to do is when the dog barks, that's when we stop talking about the film. Okay? Okay, sounds great, yeah. So uh, let me just uh, tune you in with the noise. I it. I you hear it. the dog? I hear the dog. That's the animal magic for this podcast. That's fantastic. And when five, did, minutes, yeah. when five minutes are up, the dog will bark. Obviously, as Magnus Magnusson would say to you, you've started so you can finish. Yeah. It's yeah, not yeah. a dead... You don't have to shut up talking when you hear the dog bark. Okay. But do think about reining it in and drawing to I, a close. You can just abruptly I, end if you want. Yeah, yeah. It's completely okay. up to you. Yeah. So, number one... I've got to talk about the film for five minutes first. No, you're going to t- we're going to talk about it. I mean, you don't want yeah, yeah. We're going to talk yeah, about yeah. it. But... Okay, right, yeah. So number one in your five films that have influenced me and two that have influenced everything I've done in my adult life okay. is from 1948. Now, when I first read the title, because I'll be honest with you, this is the one I didn't know on your list. I okay. thought when I read it, Paul, knowing you as I do, that it was a punk rock art film that I'd not heard of. But no, I went and looked it up. The boy yeah. with the green hair is far from that. Tell me why this is a big influence. Well, this is one of these films that uh, you you turn the TV on on a like a Saturday afternoon, and there'd be a film on, you right. know. And uh, my brother and I sat down, and this film comes on. So the boy with the green hair, okay, and it comes on, and it's in glorious Technicolor. It is, yeah. And uh, the next thing, there's this intriguing story which in which this young boy at first he's completely bald he's re, he's regaling this psychiatrist psychiatrist for why his head is shaved and it turns out that this young fella is a war orphan okay i won't go dig too deep into it but essentially when he discovers he's a war orphan his hair turns green overnight Wow. Okay, and and because it's in glorious Technicolor, boy, is his hair green. Yeah, Plus, I'm looking at the pictures. Right? It's spectacular. Right? No, 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 right? So, well, the story is that this kid has become sort of traumatised by finding out that he's a war orphan. He's ended up living with his gramps, who's probably one of the most positive people you're ever going to see on film, right? This <laughs> gramps character alone has had a huge influence on my life, okay? But this little boy who is Dean Stockwell. Yeah, you know, Dean Stockwell of... Dean um, Stockwell, of... When, he was, when he was of, you know, uh, Blue Velvet, uh, Quantum Leap. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You no, know, Dean Stockwell, <clears throat> counterculture fella, uh, as a little boy, but instantly recognisable. Obviously, I didn't know he was then. Yeah. But when I saw this film, there's this young lad whose hair's turning green. And it turns out it's because he's a war orphan. 
And the whole reason why his hair is green is so that when people notice him, which in 1948, if you had green hair, you were going <laughs> to yeah. end up. Yeah. So he is then, has he goes in and sees these visions of these war orphan kids, and they explain to him, when anybody asks you about your hair, you explain that you're a war orphan and war is bad. And it's bad for kids. Oh, wow. So essentially, there's a there's a strong anti-war message in the film. Okay, not a bad message and to have. It's not a bad message, unless <clears throat> you know. Let's be fair. We could all do with that message. Yeah, we could all do a bit more of the anti-war but messaging. We could all do with being walking around with green hair, telling people how bad war is. In this case, particularly for children, because they're all war orphans. Yeah. Mm. Now. The reason why that film had such an effect on me, leading into my later life, I was a punk rocker. So I must have seen this film when I was probably nine or ten, got into punk music around about 12. Right. And then I figured, well, this kid was a punk rocker in 1948. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, you walk, surely he must be the first ever punk rocker. You know, he's got a real brilliant mop of green hair. And people are taking notice of him. And in the end, it's fairly, I don't want to go too much into it because I really, if you've never seen this film, Stuart, if you've never seen this film, hmm. years later, my friend, my brother, my sister, my mum was up. They were always mentioned, always said to me and Stuart over the years, remember that film? He was always the one about the boy with the green hair. BFI was showing a selection of Martin Scorsese's favourite films. All oh, right. One of them was The Boy with the Green Hair. Right? Wow. We all went as a family. Vanessa oh. came with me, my, my girlfriend. We did the full, went to the BFI, have a couple of beers. When I watched it on a big screen and literally coming out of there, it's just like, it's such an emotional film. But you come out with there going, arms aloft like yes this is just amazing and yes war is bad okay and then we went into the bar and we all got drunk and it was just the whole experience of going to the cinema together a big group of us to see a film we all knew really looking for never expected to go and see, okay go on, can never, you finish, expected, finish that? never expected to be able to go and see it in the cinema you know I've got to ask before matters. we move on Paul what I mean how did the film change in terms of going from only seeing it on the TV to seeing it like a, a shared experience with a load of strangers, but a shared experience with close ones and relatives, you know, it's like, oh, we all afterwards were like expectations blown. We knew it was going to be good, yeah. but it, you know, when people go on about one, how great the cinema is, hmm. I, I'm be, I, I used to go to the cinema quite a bit. I haven't been, obviously, because of what's been going on. Mm. And uh, I, I did recently go see the film Fanny about the American, all-female American rock band. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah, a doc, yeah. Right. And again, it's just sitting in the cinema, but because we the anticipation of going to see this film that we, we had vague memories of, but always kind of mentioned it over the years, mm. you know. And even now... I've got this little key ring, which I carry on my keys for, yeah. for the house, which has got the film poster for the boy with green hair in it. My mum's written on the back of it, what would Gramps say? Oh. Because Gramps is like, if you start thinking, oh, I'm having a shit day, then he goes, what would Gramps say? He'd be like, ah, I'm not, he's Irish. I'm not going to do an Irish accent. Ah, the day's going to be fine. You know, this is, you know. It's a real spirit lifter of a film. Well, you know, there's there's few times this happened, but you've there's you have definitely sold me on a film that I feel like I've missed. So yep. I will rectify that as soon as is possible. Please, please do, and let me know what you think. Now we're moving into the what I'm going to call the 1973 trilogy. I, you know what? I got a, I had a feeling you may call it that. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a fairly epic trilogy because they're not they're not. Despite the only similarity is they're from the same year. Yeah. But the three films are very, very different. So yes. um, I've put them in alphabetical order. So there's no, this isn't a preference Paul has okay. imposed yeah. on me. Yeah. Yeah, I've yeah. just gone alphabetical. So the okay. first of your 1973 choices 
is um, Nicholas Rogues. Okay. Don't look now. So where okay. where what what's the influence there, and where where does what, what is it about that film? The the influence about that film is to me. I always refer to it as a psychological horror film. Okay, because obviously the story is something awful, mm. but it's a realistic something that could happen. They begin they, this couple's child drowns. Yeah, right? and as you can imagine. You can't imagine how awful something like that happening to you. And then, obviously, there's there's also, bear in mind, when I saw this film, probably shouldn't really be watching it. It's another one. I came on the television. There's a, quite a famous sex scene in it as well. There is a very famous you know? sex scene. Okay. I, I can't remember whether I would have been watching this film when my parents would have been there, but more than likely, they would have been watching the film with me. Okay. Mm-hmm. I would have been right. 73. So okay, probably I was probably 10 watching a film, mm. right? But then of course this whole story unfolds. They go, they end up going to Venice and they see the psychics in the restaurant. And again, all of that stuff just freaked me out. You know, it just, you know, the woman who plays the psychic in it. So let me have a look. I just had a look. Is that the two old women in in the restaurant? Another two old women in the restaurant, and then of course there's the whole thing with the the keep sighting the figure with the red, you know, the red coat on. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like yeah. you know, so this whole thing builds up, and the way that it is shot is just it's the the best way I can say it, it's just a really unsettling film that doesn't end well. I think right. Nicholas Rogue would 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 have wanted you to feel like that. I think that was his. I mean, it's a film about grief, isn't it? And how it's a film about grief and people trying to overcome grief and they do something and then this turn of events leads to a, a pretty horrible ending. Mm. But also the whole the build up with the the seeing the visions of things, seeing the you know the boat going with his wife on the boat and she's supposedly back in London. All these things that. You know, you're trying to get your head around it. And then at the end of it, there's the big finish to the film, you know, and it's this horrible looking figure that turns around and, uh, well, kills Donna Sutherland, essentially. And the the thing with it, it just stuck with me. I think it's probably the first time I had a nightmare after watching a film. Really? Oh, yeah. It actually made me, and I was like, even now, when I think about it, when I think about that film, it, it makes me slightly unsettled, you know. And, and it right, but but then years later, I'm going to talk about. I ended up on going to America first time ever in my life with a band called Snuff, and we flew to Newark Airport, right, and we had to put some equipment into a hold in Newark Airport. And as I'm carrying this martial amp on my own, I heard a voice behind me and says, do you want a hand with that? And it was Donald Sutherland. Oh, ho, ho. And, and I turn around and I see Donald Sutherland. Don't look now. And it lit- I'm literally like, when I, it frightened me, but too, I was like, it's bloody Donald Sutherland. <laughs> you know what I mean? Welcome to America. I was like, I really like that film. It's mm. one of my favourite films, you know. And yeah. I, if, I, if I ever see it and it comes on the television, I always watch it. I, I feel the same way as when I was a young, you know, 10-year-old and I see it and I still, even though I kind of know what's going to happen, I still afterwards and like nervy after watching it. It puts me on edge. I, I think it's, no, I think you're right. I think it's a film, the more you watch it, the more, because because that journey that, that um that the, they go on where, you know, Julie Christie is the spiritual feeling one and yeah, yeah. Donald Sutherland is the logical, rational one. Yeah. And yeah. he's having to have all of his values in life and the way he sees the world challenged because yeah. essentially he won't admit, he, it's, it's him not admitting he's feeling grief, isn't it? Essentially. No, no. And he's trying, he's trying, he's trying to best. fight grief. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, they're obviously both grieving. Mm. I mean, that, you know, 
and this thing is supposed to take them out of. To make a rich, smooth cold brew, Tim Horton steeps 100% Arabica beans for 16 hours. What could be richer than that? Well, uh... How about blending in swirls of sweet Irish cream? Rich enough? Ooh, I guess. Not quite, because Tim Hortons tops that cold brew with the cloud of sweet cold foam. Now, what could be richer than that? Nothing? Exactly. Irish cream cold brew with cold foam now at Tim Hortons. Or try cold foam on any of your Tim Hortons favorites. Modifications extra for a limited time at participating U.S. locations. You're finally at that hot new spot. The one your friends keep raving about. Sitting across from your date. It's going... Another round? Really well. And that dish you've been dying to try? Oh, it's headed your way. You can smell it. Hear it sizzling fresh off that skillet as it comes closer, closer, and served. Go ahead. Enjoy. After your phone sneaks a bite first. When you're with Amex, it's not if it's going to happen, but when. American Express. Don't live life without it. That. And then they end up with this meeting with these two clairvoyants who kind of put her at ease because they say that they're in contact with their daughter. Yeah. Again. I can't imagine... Many people haven't seen it, but no, it's, well worth it. it's a brilliant, brilliant film. Now, the second one in the 1973 trilogy, going in alphabetical order, is a okay. whole different kettle of fish. Okay. A whole different kettle of fish. We're talking about Enter the Dragon. All right. Now, when I've said about two of those films, literally having an effect on every single thing that I've done in my life. Go on, yeah. It starts with Enter the Dragon, okay? Right. And my whole, when I was a kid, yeah, right, my grandparents ran a pub, run pubs. Mm. They ran a huge working men's club in Port Albert called the Seaside Social and Labour Club, okay? Right, And in the Seaside Social and Labour Club, they showed films. Now, I, I heard about Bruce Lee and I started buying magazines and became slightly obsessed with becoming Bruce Lee. Mm. So I got to go see Enter the Dragon. I wasn't allowed to go and see Enter the Dragon. I wouldn't have gone into the cinema to see Enter the Dragon. It was an ex about, Of course, right? So I go into a workman's club full of pissed, can I say that? Yes. Yeah. Pissed up Welsh men, primarily. Mm. There wouldn't have been women in there. To watch. My own man's like, you can go and see Enter the Dragon, right? No way. So go to see Enter, right, right, way. So it's on a screen, <laughs> right? So it's on a screen in the workman's club and I'm watching this thing and then halfway through it, it stops. And then my grand goes, oh, you've got to come and have some pasties now. And I'm like, why would they stop the film halfway through it? Turns out there were strippers on. <laughs> So I'm distracted. I don't think my dad came in at the pasty. <laughs> <laughs> know what I mean? Yeah. So I'm in there having this really lovely pasty, by the way. Yeah. You know, which my gran had specially prepared. And I go back and I watch Enter, I watched Enter the Dragon and the Big Street. And then, then the floodgates have, have opened. I am now fully in the zone of Bruce Lee. I want to become Bruce Lee. How do I become Bruce Lee? Right. How I became Bruce Lee was going to do judo in the YMCA in Port Albert. Did you? Yeah. I've since gone on to do karate and I've become a black belt in karate. But that whole thing started with seeing Enter the Dragon. And I, I again, Enter the Dragon. If Enter the Dragon is ever on, even if I've got to go to bed and I'm working the next day, and three in the morning, Enter the Dragon is on, I will watch it. And I know every single word in that film. From the beginning to the end, the characters, all of it. I never get bored of it. If you have never seen an dragon, whether you like martial arts, whether you like Bruce Lee, you cannot fail to be impressed by that film. And also, worldwide, in the amount of tra- I've travelled, probably one of the most famous people in the whole world, Bruce Lee. Yeah. And he died before he got, before that film even hit. So what, you know what, I mean? what for you then is the, for someone who, for the, for the rare person listening in that might not have seen it, what is the quintessential scene for you in Enter the Dragon? What, 
what is the quintessential scene in Enter the Dragon. Yeah. It has to be at the end when he comes up against the evil Han character whose island he is on mm. and he's in the Hall of Mirrors. Yes. And at the end, he sees all these images of himself and of Han. He can't figure out what's coming from where, who's doing what. So he has the brain wave. He is Bruce Lee mm. smashing the mirrors. And then at the end, he, uh, you know, he wins. And it is just fantastic. It's film. I mean, I love all his films. I love all Bruce Lee films. But it is just, obviously, it's a big budget. He's, it's the one that made him a star. And it's just, you know, it just stands out now as with all the special effects and everything in, in newer films, newer sort of martial arts films, mm. etc. He still has that fantastic look. And it's him, isn't it? It's, he's just a star. But he's also very good at martial arts. No, it was. And it's... it's as a school, as a school kid, certainly. I mean, I saw it. I remember seeing it on TV in the eighties for the first time, and it, and it had lost none of its power. No, no. But I also, it's another one that if you can get to see that on, uh, I went to see at the BFI. I went to see Fist of Fury, which is a, a, a way lower budget film. Yeah, but watching it on a big screen, it literally just. The action just jumps out at you. And I remember it was the same watching that on this, you know, in this... I mean, everybody after that film came out, did it? Did it I mean, I don't know what it was after, like for you, but I remember I remember things like nunchuckers being illegal, in inverted commas. Yeah, yeah. We all are. Yeah. And, we throw, are, right? and yeah. throwing, making throwing stars in metalwork. Of course. <laughs> you know, we all sat... At, even I had to go making those nunchuckers. And after I belted myself in the face about five times, it's like, it's not probably not for me, you know. Yeah. But, right. you know, you had to go. Yeah. Right then, sir. The uh, the final one in your 1973 trilogy... Okay, well, I don't know what this one is. Yeah. ...is... Uh, is I mean, I think I think a clue would be... Mark. It's one of Mark Commode's favourite films of ever. He wrote his okay. PhD in it, I think. Oh, um, did he really? Wow. I am indeed talking about William Friedkin's The Exorcist. Do you want to tell us how oh, that features yeah. in the Paul Summers' life? No. Again, this was a film that I saw, you could not, when this film came out, open a newspaper without some kind of story about somebody who had done something after seeing The Exorcist or this happening in somebody's house after watching The Exorcist or Ouija boards, right? Mm. Stuart, you must have had to go on a Ouija board. Do you know, I'm a big scaredy cat. I've never done one. Have you not? Well, don't bother me because you will properly shit yourself. <laughs> Does that mean I, you've done I, one? Yes. And I probably shit myself. Sorry. Right? All I'm saying is that whole hype around the film, you could not get away from it. But of course, I couldn't go and see The Exorcist in the cinema. Mm. Although, apparently, let me, I'm just checking my notes, it wasn't rated X. So you could go and see it. If, if I may be wrong, but there was a big uproar about the rating because I think the studio didn't think the film was going to do well. So it didn't have an X rating when it came out in the cinemas to try and get more people. Right? How I ended up getting to see The Exorcist. Go on, however, tell us more. Is when it was in the heyday of the video shop. And in the video shop, if you knew the bloke working in the video shop, right, mm -hmm. you could get an undercounter video. And our mate, Simon Neath Punk Needs, right, <laughs> football hooligan extraordinaire and all-round decent fella, right. looking after us slightly younger punk rockers, hey, lads, we're all going to go watch The Exorcist at my mum's house this afternoon, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, he knew we were going to be very frightened. We get to the house. He's got a video recorder. Well, his mum had a video recorder. You know, big deal, right? Mm. Closes the curtains, makes it dark, right? And we're talking about, you know, we, we, it's broad daylight outside. It's probably like one o'clock on a Saturday afternoon. Mm. And there's a big gang of us in his living room on the set e, watching The Exorcist on video, VHS video. Within minutes, we're all shitting ourselves and I'm not 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 like not even a little bit scared right yeah 
properly terrified by it because it's about you know themes of religion, the devil. You know, there's some fairly graphic things that go on in that. Are you? Film. Are you? A, are you? Were you raised a Catholic? No, I wasn't raised a Catholic, but you know, my, some of my family went to church. But it's that whole thing. It was like that crass song. Remember, they had that song that apparently, if you listened to it, it was blasphemous, and you'd you'd get like visited by spirits or whatever. Of course, you know. Anyway, similar vibe. Yeah. Starting watching The Exorcist now. Halfway through it, because we drank so much, we probably drinking, busting to go to the toilet. I was too afraid to go to the toilet in his house. Literally. Brilliant. This is like quarter to two in the afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> in, a, in, a, in a house. And I'm too afraid to go to the toilet. A couple of years later, we went to see a, a midnight showing in the Castle Cinema of The Exorcist. Same thing. There was this old woman. I'm saying old. She's probably only new. The thirties, but you know when someone's got a torch up against their face, coming around selling ice creams and the exercise, I literally nearly jumped out of my skin. What are your ice creams? <laughs> Boom, gone. Right again, all of us drinking in there. There might have been a few other things going around in the you could hear the cans opening, the inhalation of uh, various, you know, this kind of thing going on. People giggling in the background, but then people obviously properly terrified. Shrieks, you know. And there was a big gang of us, all of us drunk. Shouldn't have taken booze in there, but we did. But then, side product of drinking, busting go to the toilet. Could I go to the toilet in the pitch dark castle cinema, even though I was desperate to go? Of course not, because you know why? Because I'm bloody terrified because I'm watching next. Even though you'd seen it before, you were still terrified. I've seen it before. Every, oh, mate even though you know what's coming when I watch it. I live in a church, right? Thinking about stuff like that. When I first moved into the church, I was like, I don't know if I can live in here. I would literally lay in bed thinking about the exorcist and, or, you know. I must admit, I think- my, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not a religious person at all, but the dark side of it scares me. Like, I'm quite happy to go, there's no God, but I'm yeah, not as yeah. confident about, about the dark side. And that's really contradictory, isn't it? Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, uh, my grandmother used to always claim that she could see uh, dead dead people. Really? Yeah. And she, oh, yeah, absolutely. And uh, one of the pubs that she ran in me, the Duke of Wellington, was haunted. And she said she would always see this figure every night at the Duke, even though it wasn't there, you know. Mm. But what my grand said to me was, it's not the dead you've got to fear, it's the living, which I thought was very wise. She was a very wise woman, yeah. So there you go. That's, I mean, essentially just to swap ghost stories. My, we were watching, I, mean, I was watching a horror film with my dad. Yeah. And he just turned to me, he goes, he just said, he said, I've got a ghost. I said, what do you mean I've got a ghost? <laughs> and he goes, yeah. she comes to visit me. I said, what do you mean she visit you? She, he says, when I'm, yeah. sometimes I wake up and she sta- she's lying above me, staring down at me. Oh, God. wow. I'd have, I'd have been scared, yeah. wouldn't you? Yeah, but yeah, but but that's the thing. My, my grandmother said it's all like, you know, off the. Co- yeah, I can see dead people it's as if like, like everybody does. I was like, like you saying anybody want a cup of tea? You yeah, know, it's like well, this is it. My, my dad says, my dad says to me, I says, so what did you do? He goes, well, nothing. She looks at me, and then she just turns into smoke and disappears. <laughs> wow! But he calls it his ghost. I just like the idea that it's his ghost. Well, yeah, yeah. All gonna have a hobby, Paul. You have to, yeah. Yeah, and that's, you know, that's as good good a hobby as any, I guess. Indeed. Now, we're at the final choice of your five films that have influenced me, Paul Summers. Okay. And okay. two that have influenced everything you've done in your li- in your adult life. Okay. We are now moving into a new decade as well. Only just. We are. Yeah, we are just. 1980s, yeah. Stanley Kubrick's foray into horror, The Shining. Yes. Tell me yeah. more. Well... Again, what can I say? You're talking Shining. about one of my favourite films ever, by the way. So you're in. Well, you know what? Again, anytime you choose to watch this film, you are going to be equally as frightened as the very first time that you get to see it. Mm. Even though you know what's coming, you know what the story is, you know all of the characters, you know exactly what's going to happen. It's still scares the living daylights out of you. Mm. And this is another one 
which I vividly remember because I did have a really bad nightmare after it. And we'd all stayed up, you know, let's watch The Shining. Another great idea. We'd all <laughs> probably been out, as as would always be the case, been out and about partying, having a bit of a laugh. Then the lights go off. Then we're watching The Shining. Anytime you choose to watch this film, you are going to be equally as frightened as the very first time that you get to see it. Mm. Even though you know what's coming, you know what the story is, you know all of the characters, you know exactly what's going to happen. It still scares the living daylights out of you. Mm. And this is another one which I vividly remember because I did have a really bad nightmare after it. And we all stayed up, you know, let's watch The Shining. Another great idea. We'd all <laughs> probably been out, as as would always be the case, been out and about partying, having a bit of a laugh. Then the lights go off. Then we're watching The Shining. Terrified. I can't remember whether I was too tired if I'd go to the toilet or not. By the time I eventually got to bed, I can remember laying awake for ages just thinking about it. And then having this horrific nightmare and but it coincided with my sister's boyfriend at the time we, we stabbing his toe on something downstairs so letting out this loud scream so right. as i woke up from the nightmare there was an actual scream so he's like he's, he's like doing it on cue so with your nightmare he's killed he's literally <laughs> waited for me to wake bolt up right in the bed after watching the shining and uh have this nightmare and it, and this blood curdling scream is going rattling through the house at the same time and I'm like am I awake was it a nightmare I remember watching The Shining and I, the night was so bad it really took me a good few years to watch The Shining again and then I was like right I'm going to watch it that's another one if I'm in the house on my own and it comes on I won't watch it oh you won't, won't. no no but I've stayed in so many hotels obviously because of the work that I do mm. and it's a classic you know, mm. you stay in one of these old hotels. And oh, I, you've, you know, you've, you've stayed in one. You felt like you're in the... I'm in The Shining. Yeah. You come out and you're like, wow, anybody else think we're in that hotel in The Shining? Which I didn't know this. After seeing it the last time, which again scared the living daylights out of me, which was fairly recent, a couple of years back, uh, I went into a bit of a shining internet hall, you know, and mm. I was like, okay, what was the name of the hotel? Turned out they built it all in. In Boreham Wood. Yeah, yeah. The they, built the whole, it was, they built it all. And I was like, a Stanley Kubrick is close to there anyway. I had no idea about that whole, the whole scenes, everything that was filmed. It was all filmed in Boreham Wood. Jack Nicholson was living in London at the time. And I was like, wow. You know what I mean? That Those scenes are, are so pivotal in it mm. with the, the kids, the twin girls, you know, I'm, I'm a twin, the twin girls on the bikes and the room uh, and and all of it that just, and of course the here's Johnny and the, my favourite fella, let me get, get into this, Scatman Crothers. Oh, yes. Right. Who is also in one through the cuckoo's nest? He is indeed. You know, yeah, right. Plays a completely different part in that, obviously. But uh, yeah, again, it's just one of those things that I remember the nightmare because I haven't had. A, I don't want to say I haven't had a lot of nightmares because I curse myself and then go to bed the night and have a humdinger. But uh, yeah, again, really surprised me that uh, Stephen King didn't like the film. I read afterwards, he really did. Yeah, dislike, yeah, no, he wasn't. He wasn't like the firm. He didn't think it was, you know, did the was faithful to the book or whatever. But I've never read that book. I read Carrie. I read the book Carrie, and I saw the film, and I love both of them. Mm. But to me, I I don't I don't feel personally like I I like that Stanley Kubrick's version of that. To me, is like, I mean, to me, I, I thought all of the, the the you know the cast. It's just like Did you, I mean the thing I read recently I didn't know I didn't know about Shelley Duval was awarded a Razzie for her performance in it because oh. you know they wanted to take the mic out and they rescinded it after a, I think they've rescinded it since yeah but you you well, talk I, this The Shining is one of the films that I've had the exp- I I watched it in broad daylight middle of the afternoon with my cousin Dawn and we'd have been about eleven I reckon 
Yeah. And so there's not, the curtains aren't even shut. So it's not even dark. No, no. And we will, I mean, my mum and dad and my auntie and uncle went out and, le- yeah. and we left us watching The Shining. Yeah. Wise. And yeah. then when it finished, sorry, when it finished, none of us would go, neither of us would go upstairs until the, till our parents came back. Like scared, because I, 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 I mean, I think it's the power of what you know. As an adult now watching it, and you think yeah. of the way he 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 goes in tangents, and it's absurd, and it's just like the the imagery of the blood isn't like a narrative, but it is a freaky thing to watch. And as an eleven year old, oh yeah, you can't yeah. compute it. No, well, yeah, I mean, it's blood. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And all, also, I think. That's what's so brilliant about these films, you know, that they can literally go, you can say to yourself over and over, this is a film. We've chosen to watch this for entertainment. Yeah. We've put ourselves through this and now I'm too scared to go to the toilet at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> have you, out of that? interest, as a fan of The Shining, have you watched the documentary Room 237? No, I've not. So I would check that out. It is, I think it's six or seven theories about okay. The Shining by Crackpots. Oh, okay. And and how do I get to have a look at this? Where, where do I watch that on? I think it's on one okay. of the streamers. I'll, I'll, well, okay. we'll, we'll, we'll two, talk three. offline when... Uh, room, t- room two, three. Okay, definitely. Room two, it's definitely. amazing. One of, the th- one of the theories is just simply where the guy plays the film backwards and forwards at the same time, overlapping, and how every okay. image matches. It is unbelievable. Wow. Yeah, but, but there's a lot more. There's a lot of other more freaky stuff. It's like basically people have gone mad trying to work out what it is about The Shining that makes yeah. it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the I, film I, that I it is something like that. It, it, you're always going to get people who are going to dig deeper into it and yeah. come up with it. And and the, the guy who made the documentary went right. I'm going to go for the maddest theories that we <laughs> that we can find out there and bring the people. To. But yeah. as an as an aside, the guy who directed that film directed a second documentary called The Nightmare which is a documentary about people who get sleep paralysis. You know, when you get night terrors. I get it. I get them. Yeah. I have never been so scared watching a film in my life because I had never heard of this. I, yeah. I've, I've, I'd lived this blissful, ignorant life. Yeah, I've not yeah. known what a night terror was. Oh, and, no, I get them. And I'm from, yeah. I, last place I lived before I moved to London was Presswich. And one of the people in the documentary is from <laughs> Presswich. And I'm like, wow. this is too real. Yeah, well, the, the, I don't know what it is. I, I haven't had one for a long, long time. Again, I don't want to jinx myself. But demonic fonts have a song called Night Terrors, and it's based on Night Terrors of myself and my twin brother and my mum. Used to get fairly regularly, and when my brother and I share hotel rooms on tour with people, yeah, as the as the Tokyo Dragons will attest, to, yes, we have these wobblers. They refer to them as wobblers. Mm. One could be, I, I'll see a demon in the ceiling and it will be as real to me as it's just like, I can literally feel like the thing is sweating on top of me. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And, and you can't move. The thing about it, you're paralyzed. So I don't know what state of sleep you're in. So you see this thing, then you wake up and you go, I know that's not there. I'm terrified because of it. I'll go back to sleep and it'll be there again. Yeah, that's what these guys are saying on the documentary. Yeah, yeah. It really is yeah. unbelievable. Yeah. Well, look- and, and, you know, yeah. Well, let's just recap. So five films that have influenced Paul Summers and two that have influenced everything he's done in his adult life are, and I'll just run through the titles very quickly, The Boy with the Green Hair from 1948, the 1973 trilogy of Don't Look Now, Enter the Dragon, The Exorcist, and then finally Breaking into a New Dawn of 1980 with Stanley Kubrick's The Shining. What a fantastic selection, Paul. Oh, well, what can I say? They are fantastic films. And let's remind people then, how can they get I Love Demonic Fonts? How you can get our album that we're all very proud of, uh, I Love Demonic Fonts. You can get it all all record shops online. You can get it through our band camp. But what we would love for you to do is come and see us play live. If you get to see us play a gig, you won't be disappointed. It's always a good old shindig. Come down, actually, within this month's Shindig magazine as well. And come down and buy our vinyl record or CD or listen to it, nick it, stream it. Do what you like, but listen to our music. Yeah. Indeed. Well, look, it just gives me to say thank you very much, Paul, for giving your time. 
Macy's Memorial Day sale has everything you need to dive into summer the right way with specials like 30 to 40 percent off sandals, slides, and more, and 25 to 40 percent off tops and shorts from Ink, Tommy Hilfiger, and more. Plus, refresh your space with 50% off hotel bedding. And Macy's Star Rewards members can earn rewards even faster during Star Money bonus days. See Macy's.com slash Star Rewards. Savings off regular sale and clearance prices. Exclusions apply. 5G is here, but the big carriers want you to sign a pricey long-term contract to get access. Well, not anymore, because Straight Talk Wireless has rolled out 5G coverage nationwide with deals like our Silver Unlimited plan for just $45 a month and no contract. And get a Samsung Galaxy A32 5G for $249, all on America's best networks. 5G coverage, 5G phones, less money. Straight Talk Wireless, available at Walmart and Walmart.com. 5G-capable device required. Actual availability, coverage, and speed may vary. See terms and conditions at straighttalk.com.